I mean, obviously, there's a lot of talk about the Fed and, and you know, how soon they can start this cut, cutting cycle. Is the Fed, do you think, really achieving that soft landing? I do. That's been our view that we're set for a soft landing or on our way to a soft landing for the last year or over a year. And a year ago, we said that this cycle is different coming into 2023. This cycle is different. It's not like the traditional overheating demand driven cycle, but really a normalization post COVID, which allows you to bring down inflation even while maintaining reasonable growth and employment growth. And I think that's playing out. And so the Fed is on its way to achieving uh, the soft landing. Obviously, no guarantees, but I like what I'm seeing. Yeah, you heard from Governor Waller uh, just last week, and he said, you know, we have to be careful, at least no hurry to, to start cutting rates. There seemed to actually you know, lead to this sort of repricing in the market. There's still a chance, though, that a March cut is, is now a coin toss. Goldman Sachs, though, you're saying is quite likely. How strong of a case is it for a March cut now? It's still our baseline because I think it is consistent with the inflation data and what we heard from Chair Powell at the December press conference when he said that they would like to cut well before inflation gets back to 2%. Now, core PCE inflation has been running at 2%, actually slightly below, for the last six months. The year-on-year -year rate is still closer to 3%, but by the second quarter will probably be pr pretty close to 2 So if you combine all those things, then a March cut would make sense. That said, a March cut or cuts in general over the next few months under our forecast are somewhat optional because of what I said earlier. The economy is holding up you know, pretty well. We don't think it's essential that they, that they cut here, but it would be consistent with the signaling. What do you say to the critics out there that, you know, we, 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 we consensus was that we might get into a recession last year in the U.S. That was wrong. We might get it wrong this time again. You know, if you look at, you know, the cracks in the labor market, rates are now at a restrictive level that does usually lead to some sort of recession. You're seeing that in the soft data as well. How do you, how do you explain that right now? Well, there's always going to be a range of indicators. If I look at the entire set of indicators on the labor market, I think the cracks are pretty limited. Yes, there was some weakness in the ISM non-manufacturing employment number. There was a weaker labor force participation number. We have definitely seen a slowdown in hiring. But if I look at the thing that concerns me most in recessionary cycles, namely layoff waves, I'm not seeing any of that. Look at the claims numbers. Layoffs continue to be very, very low. And I'd say on the impact of the funds rate, the impact of monetary policy, I'm more in the financial conditions camp. I look at the impulse from financial conditions to growth. That was definitely very negative in late 2022, early 23, after the Fed had been going at 75 basis points a meeting. But now it looks much more neutral. So I'm, I'm, I'm just not seeing the, the big hit that is going to put us into a recession. Is that Fed put then restored in markets, you think, yeah? Well, Fed put, I think usually people refer to a Fed put when, they, when they're talking about you know, the Fed taking out insurance against a big decline in, in asset markets. And that, you know, we're not seeing big declines in asset markets. Now, of course, if you did see a big decline in asset markets, that also would have implications for Fed policy. I think that's perfectly legitimate. Fed put is often used in a somewhat pejorative sense, but it's, it makes perfect sense that the Fed responds to changes in financial conditions by adjusting their policy. Um, obviously, you, you mentioned about where we might see 2% inflation this year. It, how should I look at Middle East tensions, for example? Should I just ignore that shipping rates have spiked? Have I, should I ignore that there's hints of commodity inflation right now? What could upend, do you think, this disinflation trend? Well, I think as far as headline inflation is concerned, of course, commodity prices are always going to have a bigger impact than, than on core inflation. So far, what we've seen out of the Middle East, you know, post uh, Hamas attacks has been pretty limited. We haven't really seen a big move in oil prices and the shipping cost impact is probably still measured in 
you know, maybe basis points or small numbers of tenths of a, of a percentage point in terms of the inflation numbers. So, so far, this is still more a, you know, limited, uh, a limited hit. But, of course, geopolitics is hard to predict. There is a lot of tension in the Middle East. It could escalate. And if it escalates, then it would have a more, more significant impact. And, you know, we'd obviously uh, try to put that into our forecast as soon as possible. I don't know how many questions are you getting about this election in, in the U.S. that's happening at the end of the year. And increasingly, this seems like there could be another Trump presidency. I mean, how are you looking at that right now? Uh, if, especially implications here for Asia, if we see imposition of tariffs or even tax cuts in the U.S. Well, I do think that it is going to be a very important for 2025 and 2026 what happens in the, in the election. And by the way, not just the presidential election, but also the Senate and the House. And if you had unified Republican control of the White House and both chambers of Congress, then, yeah, I think you probably would have a higher probability of a fiscally more expansionary solution. There is a certainly increase in tariffs potentially on the on the table, given what uh, what Trump has said, so that is that that is definitely you know important for U.S. trading partners. It's not just important for for the U.S. economy, but also for U.S. trading partners. And you know, ultimately, governments and businesses are going to have to deal with what you know whatever ends up happening. It's a little bit too early to tell, but it I think especially in the second half of the year will be a significant market mover. Yeah, I mean, obviously, that's something that China's watching very closely. If you have, you know, as resilient as growth as you're projecting for, for the U.S. this year, is that enough of an offset, you think, given the weakness that we're seeing in China for the global economy? Yeah, I mean, I think it has been enough of an offset to keep global growth at sort of 2.6, 2.7% if you aggregate by market exchange rates. That is roughly the global trend GDP growth rate, even with China decelerating, and we have it decelerating further in 2024 from 5.2 percent on 4.8 percent, we think global growth is going to be relatively, relatively stable. The U.S. is relatively stable. There's, you know, some acceleration, I think, in some places, hopefully some acceleration in Europe as we go through the year. So, yeah, we do have, a, you know, some natural offsets in the individual country growth numbers. How worried are you of, of the macro weakness in China here right now? Are we likely to see a stabilization of the property market? I mean, what, what are you looking in terms of policy signals moving forward? So my expectation is that the headwinds that China is facing from demographics, property, property-related debt, that those still have a ways to run. The property adjustment is not yet close to done. You could argue, and in fact, our team has argued, that the impact on annual growth from property weakness probably diminishes somewhat over time, in part because the property sector just shrinks and then it's going to have a smaller impact on the macro economy. But, but these headwinds are still out there. That's the main reason for the deceleration in growth. The policymakers are stabilizing uh, in the sense that they are providing support. They don't want growth to slow too much, but at the same time, they're not willing to really use the bazooka to uh, provide a very large amount of stimulus. Their experience with past cycles where they've been very aggressive in stimulating, especially through property-related debt, yeah. has not been positive, and so they're more cautious.